We have definitely all been there where we are finally able to get kind of a group of people together and we are so excited for game night, but you're not really sure how many people are going to be there. And so you kind of start packing a lot of little mini games and you're like, I just want to like get some games that I know that I can teach. They're pretty easy to learn, um, generally a little bit on the quicker side of playing. And I recently had one of these nights where finally, it's been a long time, but we were actually able to get the whole group together. Um, you know, my, my main gaming group, we're finally able to get the group together, but I was thinking, you know, we might kind of do a little change up, play some lighter games. Cause I wasn't sure when all of us would get there and some people would kind of shuffle in and out. And so I was kind of thinking strategically about what game Games I would bring to a night like that. First off, I just want to say this bag is absolutely adorable. It was uh, sent to me by a viewer who made it um, and I'll go ahead and link their Instagram um, down below because I just think this is really, really cool. It's awesome. There's one that's kind of obvious that it looks like you can already see what the game is. Um, so I will go ahead and start with that. So we've got the first of two social deduction games. Um, the first game that I had in here was Secret Hitler. Now this is a game that you have to make sure people are okay with the theme before presenting this. Um, I do really enjoy it because it is social deduction, but it also has kind of a board mechanic to it where you're going to be passing fascist or liberal laws and then towards kind of the center of the game um, once the fascist or kind of towards the middle of the game when the fascists get like three of their laws in policy um, then they can actually try to basically make Hitler the chancellor and then the fascist team automatically wins there's kind of some cool mechanics with the board itself as the kind of fascist laws get passed there's some abilities that the current president president or acting president gets. And I do also like the kind of two system, the dual system where you have a president and then that president tries to get a chancellor to be their chancellor. And then everybody as a group kind of votes in this kind of governing party. I've always kind of liked that dynamic and it's a really, really beautiful production as well. Um, just the whole thing, like graphic design, the, the general looks. Um, it's definitely one of my favorite social deduction games. I really, really enjoy it. And if the theme is um, something that you aren't really liking, but you still want to try the game, there are kind of reskins that are online. So I would highly recommend checking those out. I know there's one that's essentially about a kind of a Star Wars re-theme where it's uh, trying to get Emperor Palpatine as chancellor. So kind of a cool, kind of a cool little alternate theme for that game. And the next game that I have in my bag is going to be this small game called Parade. Now, this is a Alice in Wonderland themed game, but uh, let's be honest, this is definitely not a game that you're going to be getting for the theme. At least you might get it for the theme, but it will probably disappoint you if so. It is cute. I love the artwork. I love the card artwork. It's very, very good. This is also a game that's just beautiful and it's um, just a really nice production. But essentially, this game is a game that was introduced to me at a convention by Thinker themer. It was at Dice Tower West. And I, I never forgot the game after that. So thank you, Thinker Themer. I went out. I finally got a copy. Me and Kate love this game. Um, it's a really easy game to teach, but it's so thinky. You essentially have a kind of building line of cards called the parade, and you are required to be playing a card to the parade. And depending on the value of that card, it determines what cards you might have to take into kind of your tableau. And in, in this game, you do not want to get point, points. That might be the most thematic thing to Alice in Wonderland. It, you know, completely opposite, right? So you don't want points in this game. So when you play a card, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be counting back the cards previous to the card that you played. So if I play a two, I'm going to count back two cards. Now, any cards that are within that kind of range are safe, but any cards after that, I have to potentially put into my tableau. If they're equal to or less than my card value, they come into my tableau, or if they are the same color, they come into my tableau. And so it's a really kind of puzzly game where if you play a high card, you can save a lot of potential cards coming into your supply. 
but if you play a low card as a strategic point, you might get less points than if you had saved that later, and you might get a lot of, uh, you know, cards that are of the same color. There's all these kind of different things and so much thinking involved. The thing also that I love a lot about it is at the end of the game when you are doing the scoring, you're kind of scoring for your different piles of suits, um, and you're getting, you know, all these points for each of those piles um, based on the value of those cards too, so you don't want high value cards. But the card type that you have most of, you turn down and you only get one point for each of those. And I always find that very fun because at some point you're just going to have like six red cards in front of you and all the other players at the table have maybe three red cards in front of you. And you're just like, you know what? I'm just going to keep getting red cards because at this point they're all going to be only giving me one point instead of their actual printed values because nobody's going to pass me in red cards. And that's kind of the gist of Parade. It's a very fun, thinky, puzzly little game. Um, it plays two to six players. Oh, I didn't even say the player count for Secret Hitler. Secret Hitler plays five to 10 players. So that's going to accommodate some of the larger group. And then Parade, that's two to six. Also a very, very great game. All right, what else do I got in here? So I have got three more games to show off. Um, we've got Dungeon Mayhem. Oh, I had the box upside down. Dungeon Mayhem is a game that has been in my collection for quite some time. I think I've even showed it off on the channel a couple of times, but one of the things that I love most about this game is that it is probably the quickest teach, one of the quickest teaches of this set of games. I love the production of this game. It comes with so many different characters once you get the kind of this monster set because there was a hero pack that you could get that had basically six characters and then you could get or what was it, four characters? Yeah, so you get a hero pack with four characters, and then you can get like a booster pack with like two more characters. They're all based on D&D &D kind of classes. And then you can get this monster set, which came with six more. So you have now a total of like 12 different characters that you can play. Anyways, this game is so easy to play. You have a deck of cards, you have a hand of like three cards, and you're just playing a card on your turn. And those cards that you play will have all these different symbols on them. Some of them will be an attack symbol, some of them will be a special ability symbol, some of them will be the ability to play another card symbol, which is how you can do some cool combos with your character. I have a couple of favorite characters that I've been playing a ton. Um, I really, really enjoy the Owlbear. They're very, very much like super, super fun. And then I also really love Sutha from the original set, uh, the Orc Barbarian, because she basically has all these really, really high damage attacks, but she kind of like wants to build up her cards into big combos and just do some huge crush moves. And it's just so much fun to kind of like feel like you're just crushing your opponents. However, I did play Delilah Deathray last night and I will say she may be my new main. Uh, provided that Sooth is okay with that, of course. This game's fun because like, even with, you know, it, it runs up to like two to six players. So pretty good amount. If you have a big group though, there are rules where you can only attack the people to your left and right. And that actually really, really helps to make it very fun. The only thing that's kind of sad about this game is that you can get knocked out. But when you have like five or six players, they have like a little ghost mechanic where you're actually kind of still playing and you can still deal damage to people that maybe like, you know, hurt you in the past. But at those like lower player counts, the four to two players, I mean, the game goes by really quickly. So you can just kind of grab another deck, reroll, play again. I really, really enjoy this game. I think it's an absolute blast. There's actually videos of people basically doing a like a tournament of this game, uh, like an official tournament. It was like kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh style. And I'm going to go ahead and link that video down below because it's a good way to show just like the insanity that is this game and just like how goofy and wild it is. So I'm going to go ahead and link that down below. All right. So the next game I've got is, well, I actually bring both of these boxes, but it's one game. Um, so I always bring, oh, I actually have, oh, I actually have three more games. Okay, perfect. There's one sneaking in here that I kind of forgot that I brought. Oops. Okay, so I've got One Night Ultimate Werewolf. I've had this game for so long that these pieces are literally like, they're not doing so good. They're like chipping and stuff. And it's because people, when they have the card, they're like rubbing it on the table and that drives me nuts. And I just found out that you can actually get sleeves for these because these have got like 
they're they're getting like oily and weird but anyways i've been playing this game for a very very long time and you know what people are always like you know there's better social deduction games out there there's better games to play if you want social deduction but still i don't know how to explain it the wild nature of this game and how quick the games go i still just freaking love it now this game you can do three to ten players so huge accommodation of player count it's literally one night basically mafia or you know if you haven't played mafia it's a one night social deduction game now one night ultimate werewolf is a game where you'll have a certain number of werewolves and they will basically be on the werewolf team now they could have some other characters that are not werewolves but they're going to have special abilities that will try to help the werewolf team right so like the minion for example if he dies uh the werewolves win but all that to say there's also, you know, all these other characters that are going to be like villagers, seers, um, all these different characters that have like different abilities. And a lot of them are pretty, pretty like super wild, um, except for if you're the villager, you're just the boring villager. It's sad, but you know, you're working for the village side if you're not a werewolf. But in this game, you're essentially going to all close your eyes. The werewolves are going to be able to see who the other werewolves are, right? And then the only other thing to that is that uh, the village team has absolutely no idea who the other villagers are. But the seer, one of my favorites, is able to check the role of another player or they might be able to check the center because in this game, you're gonna be dealing three rules that don't belong to any player. They're gonna be in the center of the table. And one of the things is, is that sometimes all the werewolves could be in the center of the pile and you as a table, you only have one day to figure out, hey, who is the werewolf? And if you find out that it's none of you guys or you think that it's none of you, you can always vote on that center pile. And I think that's a really fun kind of twist to the social deduction game. The other twist that I really like is that there's a class and I highly recommend playing with this class. If you're not playing with this class, the game is just not One Night Ultimate Werewolf, for me at least. And that is the Tanner. It is the most funny class ever because essentially, if the Tanner dies, he hates his job so much that he just wants to die. So if the Tanner dies at the end of the night, because you only get one kill in this game, like everybody votes to kill somebody. And if it's a werewolf, werewolf team loses. If it's a villager, villager team loses. If it's the Tanner, only the Tanner wins. And I think that is just absolutely hilarious that there's all these like, you know, social deductioning and like somebody's just like, yo, I'm totally a werewolf. And like, everybody's like, no, that's definitely the Tanner. But then it's like, no, wait, maybe they are a werewolf and they're just like double, you know, they're just like playing my head right now. And they're, you know, playing 5D chess, you know, it's like those kinds of moments are absolutely so freaking hilarious. And with my group, we've been playing this game so long that we have this crazy meta game, all of the different kinds of plays that we're trying to do and just like the casual like whenever I'm the werewolf, I do something really annoying and I basically say that I'm the seer sometimes and it just really complicates things because I just like getting in with it with the other actual seer if they're in the game. But on the off chance that the seer isn't actually in play and they're one of the three middle cards, it works so well to be like, I'm the seer, I looked in the center pile, I saw a werewolf and you can try to convince the table to essentially kill the pile and live as the werewolf. So much dang fun. Um, the other box in here, um, I have Daybreak as well. This is one of the many, many expansions to the game, but I really like Daybreak because it just comes with some elevated rules to add in, you know, for feeling a little spicy one of those nights. It's a really, really good addition to the kind of game night as a whole. So that's One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Um, okay, so the next game, second to last game I've got in my bag is going to be... This is, this is technically love letter but you know it's Jabba's palace love letter or the Star Wars love letter and I so love letter is a really really quick playing two to six player game that's come in the form of quite a few different themes there's a Marvel one there is just like love letter um which is like more Bridgerton style, I guess. I think there is an actual Bridgerton one now. Um, but then there's the Star Wars one, and the Star Wars one is my favorite. To be fair, I've only played this one and the original game, but I really, really love this Star Wars one because 
essentially this is a pretty simple game. Everyone's going to start with a card. There's like 19 different cards in the deck and they're all going to be kind of uh, different. So they're all going to have like special abilities. So in this case, you've got like Salacious Crumb. Um, this is a two power card. It says choose another player and look at their hand. On your turn, you're just gonna be grabbing a card from the top of the deck and you're gonna choose one of those two cards to play and then the card that you didn't play is now gonna be the one card in your hand. And depending on the agenda, which is kind of unique to the Star Wars one, you have all these different ways that the game could end. So the most common way in like love letter is to basically be the player with the highest number in their hand at the very end of the game. Cause players are gonna get knocked out of this game really quick like super, super quick. Um, because for example, like Luke Skywalker here, he's a Rebel Alliance card, uh, strength seven. It says choose another player. Um, if they have a syndicate card in hand, they are out of the round, which some cards basically have either the Rebel Alliance symbol or that syndicate symbol. I think it's called syndicate symbol, but they might have one of those too. So Luke Skywalker is really good at getting the bad guys out. And if they can get them out, that player is out, right? So it gets pretty crazy. So like, this is just one of the, one of the ways that you can win the game is highest uh, number in the hand at the end of the game wins the round. But then we've also got highest sum of syndicate cards in play wins the round. So whenever you play a card, it actually stays out in front of you. So you might actually be trying to play certain types of cards in order to win um, this agenda called Jabba's Court. Um, most rebel cards in play wins the round, exact same, but with the rebels. So there's all these cool ways to kind of end the game. It's a very, very simple game. You're just drawing a card, playing one of the two cards that you played. And since it's open information, what cards have been played, there's a lot of deduction of like, okay, I know what's left in the deck and there's a high chance that they have a four. It also is nice because it comes with this handy dandy little uh, reference sheet that comes and shows all of the different characters within the game and what their abilities are so you don't have to be super crazy good um, and remember all those they've got really nice references but that is Jabba's Palace Love Letter such a good game so easy to teach so quick to play it's absolutely wonderful I would highly recommend checking it out and that leaves me with probably the most unique game out of this list you might have not heard of this one or maybe you have and if you have you have good taste, um, but this is called Turncoats. Um, this is a game that is literally just within this bag. And it is so nice that it's within this bag because you can just open it up and it makes the board and all the components fit within the bag. So it's super, super easy to bring pretty much anywhere. Now, the reason why I love this game so much is that it's super easy to teach and it also uses such minimal components. I mean, this is a kind of cloth board and all you've got is stones of three colors. And basically what you're going to do is at set up every single one of these regions on the board is going to get two stones randomly. And then everybody playing the game is going to get eight stones that they keep in the palm of their hand. And you're going to be looking at these three colors. It could either be black, blue, or red. You're going to be looking at those and you're going to say, okay, what do I have the most of? What do I have the least of? Cause this really matters because during the game you can recruit by taking a stone from your hand and placing it onto the game board, or you can negotiate negotiate where you can basically draw a stone from the bag, then you can reveal a stone and place it back into the bag. So you can kind of like figure out kind of where your allegiance lies. There's also two different actions, march and battle, that require you place a stone inside of these kind of two sections on the game board. And that also matters because those are going to be tiebreakers for the end of the game. Now, none of this is going to make sense to you until I explain to you how the winner of the game is determined. So at the end of the game, and you're going to be counting how much influence and regions each of these colors controls on the board. So whoever has the most stones in a region. Now, once you calculate that, whoever has the most stones of that color within their hand actually wins the game. So it's kind of hidden information. You might have a lot of black stones at the beginning of the game. And so that will mean that you can do a lot of actions that can manipulate the black player pieces on the board. But will you have enough stones to still win after you spend those to do so much actions on the board? That's going to be a little bit harder to tell. What if another player has a lot of black stones? So then you might want to start using red stones and start making it look like you're trying to benefit red, but you're actually just trying to keep black safe because you've got a ton of black stones. See, 
those are the kinds of things that happen in turncoats that makes it such like a simple game, but it turns it into such a really like a very, very, very fun mind game. It's so puzzling and I just love it. And so that is why turncoats is one of the most fun games to just bring out teach people. It's super fun to play. It's so unique. And it's also just like such a cool production. I mean, this was handmade. Um, the, the designer is so, so sweet. Um, honestly, such an awesome person. So um, highly recommend you check out Turncoats. I'm going to go ahead and have a link on where to purchase their games because there is another game, which is my most anticipated game of this year called Pax Penning. That's one of my most anticipated games of the year. So definitely check them out down below. And I hope you enjoyed kind of this list of games that I would bring to kind of a party game night with my friends, an easy game games kind of easy games to bring out and play quickly. Uh, what are some of the games that you think I'm missing from my list? And also, what are the games that you automatically bring? What are those games that are going to be in your game bag? I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. That is going to be it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go ahead and drop the beat. Mm -hmm.